we are entering into the, I would say, downfall of the Greek, ancient Greek society. Um, we've talked about Euclid. We wrapped that out, up last time. So we have one more person who's kind of um, a big name and then a, a smaller name, but two, two relatively large names that happened before the decline of the Greek Empire, the Greek uh, civilization. So we'll talk about that, and then we'll talk about what happens whenever war sets in. I think we can get all of that in tonight. So um, the, the big mathematician that came out of the Greek society is Archimedes. And um, if you've paid attention to the D2L, I have a link to the Nova PBS special on Archimedes where they talk about him and his book and why it's so important. Um, they found it finally and what they're doing for it. So take a look at that video and see what you can see out of that video. It's a really cool video. I, I enjoy it. I know I'm very nerdy, but, you know, I, I think it's a cool video still. So Archimedes, his dates are about 287 to 212 BC, and basically he was born in Sicily, and then he lived during the, what you would say, the declining days or the dying days of the museum. I'll say dying here. Lived during the dying days of the museum. So that means that you know, it's well established. It's been there for years. Um, we've got Euclid going on. Archimedes is a tiny bit after that, closer to the time of Christ. And what we know about Archimedes, first of all, he is known as one of the top three. So that's pretty impressive. Top three historical mathematicians. So if you're talking about any time, um, I would say before 1500, 1600s, you're talking about the top three out of that. You've got Archimedes in there, and he's actually really well known. He did all kinds of stuff. He worked on catapults and planetariums, developing the ideas behind planetariums and what was going on with them, um, improving catapults. He worked on something, um, well, a lot of levers and pulleys. I'll get to a little story in a minute. Levers and pulleys. And in fact, there's a story about moving ships. So supposedly there was a ship that was um, run up on the, on the, the island of Sicily, run up on the shoreline, and um, people, men had pushed on it and tugged on it and tried with boats to pull it out, and they couldn't get this ship off of, um, off of the shoreline. And so they came to Archimedes, and it said that he went down and he studied it, and he set up a system of pulleys and, and all kinds of different things, rope everywhere with tons of rope and, and different angles. And it said that basically he was standing on the shore and he just gave one rope a little tug, set all of these levers and pulleys and stuff into motion, and um, the ship moved and went back out to sea. So supposedly he was really good with that. And that's where we get our quote for um, him. So just so you know, he said, and some of you might have heard this um, quote before, it's actually pretty famous. Give me a place on which to rest my lever or lever. Do you know the rest of it? Lever. And I will, yup, move the world. I know some of you have probably heard that. Move the world. So a little bit boastful about the fact that he understood angles and and uh, how to work different different forces of energy in order to be able to move large things. So a little bit of a boastful, but but yeah, he was um, definitely well into this. So there you go. Um, he approximated pi to two decimal places.
and that's pretty impressive for 300 years, basically, B.C. Um, he worked a lot with square roots, and he just didn't care. So while the Pythagoreans were stressing out over the fact that um, you've got something like square root of 13, no problem for Archimedes. It's all good. We'll just work with it. Okay, he, he could handle it. Um, what we see is that he did a lot of work with volume area and other things that end up being a precursor for calculus. So for instance, I'll give you one of my terrible pictures so you can see this. One of the things, this is actually inscribed on his gravestone, is a picture of a cylinder so I apologize in advance for my terrible artistry. Not an artist. Everybody should know that about me. Not, but, that about me by now. With a sphere inside of it. Okay, so a sphere inscribed in a cylinder. Okay. So that's actually what is on his gravestone. And if you know a little bit about um, spheres inside of cylinders and different three-dimensional objects, you may have seen this in an actual calculus class. They're, what they're trying to do is optimize the volume of the sphere, make it as big as they can, while looking at the parameters of it being contained by the cylinder. So it, it is an optimization problem. It is a calculus problem. And, um, you know, the volume of both of those items, those are three-dimensional objects. So we're talking three dimensions. So it is actually pretty advanced math there for 300 BC. And, in fact, he did... Um, he did a lot of stuff that, that people didn't see. So one of the things, if you go and watch that video, the PBS Nova video, one of the things that you'll see in there is that he wrote a book where he discussed things like this. And um, in that book is actually a lot of precursors for calculus that unfortunately the book was lost for years. I'm not gonna tell you how, you need to watch the video if you wanna know how the book was lost. Um, it's an interesting story, and how it's found, actually, is also interesting. And what they're doing with it now is also interesting. So go watch that video. But, uh, so, he wrote a book, and it's speculated that if what he had in the pre-calculus version of things, like just before calculus, if that had survived, if that had been handed down to the next generation of mathematicians, so to speak, that we would have, that the cost of us not having that book is about 1,500 to 2,000 years worth of math. So we would be far more advanced than what we are now. So just think about that. Um, the calculus didn't actually get developed until like the 1600s, 1700s. So if he had it 300 or 200 BC, you know, that's between 1,500 and 2,000 years. We could have been, I don't know, in cars by the time we were in the 1500s. And then we could have been, you know, having cell phones by the time it was the 1900s. And, you know, we could be in jetpacks by now or something like that. I always say it's the person who uh, lost this book for us that it's their fault I don't have my flying car, man. So there you go. Okay. He actually worked with the volume formulas and came up with different ones. Um, one that is actually very often used still yet is V equals 4 thirds pi r cubed, and that is the formula for a volume of a sphere. Okay. He worked with um, polygons much like Euclid did, so Hopefully you've had a chance to go onto D2L and find the thing that I put up there about Euclid's regular pentagon. And um, Archimedes was also interested in those. So he was constructing 
regular hexagons, which the hexagons are not too terribly difficult to deal with, dodecagons, which if you're not sure, that's a 12-sided polygon, and he was constructing something that was a 96-sided polygon. Now think about that for a second. I'm going to draw 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Okay, that's a decagon right there-ish. It's not regular because I just sketched it out. But this is a 10-sided-ish <laughs> polygon. And already um, it's starting to look a little circular, right? A little less. It's certainly not triangular or square or whatever. Pentagon. Oops. Okay, so these, these items are all very much their own. Even a hexagon doesn't really look like a circle, although we're starting to approximate a circle. But you get to a decagon or a dodecagon or for sure a 96-sided polygon, and you are definitely starting to look like a circle. And there's a story out there that says that actually, I've mentioned up here what's on his grave. There's a story that um, Archimedes actually requested that there be a 96-sided polygon on his gravestone and that um, the people who would have to carve it were like, uh, no, <laughs> that's not happening. So it's actually something that Gauss also did with a 17 gun. So we'll see that later. So there, there's, a, there's supposedly a story out there about that. So there you go. Um, there are actually a few kind of interesting stories out there about him. Oh, I left off sundials, so he worked with sundials also. So up there somewhere if you want to mark that. Um, one of the very interesting stories about him is the Eureka story. So it's actually a pretty well-known story. A lot of people remember it, even if you don't remember a lot else about um, Archimedes. And the reason why is because, um, well, you'll understand in a minute. Or you can watch that video, and it has a lovely video of what I'm about to describe to you. So <laughs> you, should, you should definitely see the picture of the little guy running, I'm just saying. So there's a story that the king at the time was given a crown, and it was supposed to be solid gold, but he didn't quite trust the maker of the crown. So he asked Archimedes, hey, can you figure out for me if this is really, um, really gold or not? So, so without cutting into it, you know, if it's just gold plate, um, then we've been lied to. And, but I still don't want to cut into it because I don't want to destroy the crown if it is gold. So the story goes that Archimedes actually had amazing powers of focus and concentration. So one evening he's working on this story, uh, or this, this uh, problem, and um, he decides he's going to take a bath. And as he gets into the bath, he's concentrating on this problem about how can he tell if this gold crown is real or not. That's his question. And so as he's getting into the bath, he notices that the water goes up as he gets in it and as he gets pulls his body back out of the bath he notices that the water goes back down and all of a sudden he understands a concept that was maybe not so well known before which is density and he comes up with a theory of water displacement theory of water displacement so in that he figures out that if he takes um, a crown, the crown, and weighs it, and then he has a, an equal chunk of gold weight-wise, because weight and density are two different things, right? So if he has the same weight of gold, and he puts the gold into the water, and it displaces water by so much, maybe three inches or something like that, and then he puts the crown in the water, and it doesn't displace it by the same amount of water, which it should because it's supposed to be made of the same thing, then the crown is fake. And lo and behold, he puts the chunk of gold in later. He puts the chunk of gold in and um, 
sees how dense the gold is and how heavy it is and how much it displaces the water. And uh, then they put in the crown and supposedly it does not displace as much water. So the king is unhappy because it's a fake. So, but, but the story goes like this, as he's figuring out this theory of water displacement, and he's working on that in his head, um, he sees that the water is going up and down in the bathtub, and supposedly his concentration was so much on the problem at hand that he jumps out of the bathtub and he runs down the street naked. And he's yelling out, Eureka, I've discovered it. I've found the answer. That's what Eureka means. So Eureka, Eureka. And so that's the Eureka story. <laughs> it involves him running naked down the street. And if you watch that video, they have a lovely little clip of a man. And he, all you can see is his little feet running down the street. But it's really a kind of cute, cute place in the video. So you should, you should see that. It's fun. Okay, so um, I'm going to put it here since I mentioned it a second ago. Sundials, he worked on those. And he had this lovely invention that was called the Archimedes screw. And the idea behind that, now remember he's, he's from Sicily, but he's in the time of the museum, so he's working. We have um, floods and, and droughts and different things, and it would be really nice if as we're... Um, working on crops, if we could irrigate our crops. So say this is, is a river or a lake or whatever. Um, Archimedes basically designed um, a pipe or a straw, <laughs> a massive straw. And inside of it, he has these different looping levels of material, metal, or whatever it was. Probably metal at that point, because we have metal by now. Um, and the idea being that I can stand up here on the shoreline, and there's a little crank here, and all I have to do is crank the handle, basically, similar to what a well would be um, from, you know, the Wild West, or whatever you would think of a well. I could crank this handle, and basically water would get captured inside of these loops or spools or however you want to think about it and as I crank the handle these loops and spools would move the water up even against gravity move the water up the spools until it comes out here and then I can either carry it in a bucket or I can lay some irrigation piping or you know we've got ditches it's probably a, it's probably an irrigation ditch that it's dumping into and uh, the water will just dump into the ditch and then it'll go out to where the crops are and I don't have to hand carry all of my water in order to be able to irrigate my crops so this is called the Archimedes screw and nowadays to accomplish something like this pulling water out of a river or a lake or a um, pond or something like that. Nowadays, we would use electricity, right? And we would have pumps and things like that that we would pull the water out with. So it's really interesting. Very long time ago, pre-electricity, he manages to do, to put together this invention, basically, that defies gravity and pulls the water up from, from the riverbed. So that would be very useful um, in times of drought in Africa, I'm just saying. So... And remember that Alexandria is in, um, in Africa, up in Egypt. So there you go. All right. So I think that's it for Archimedes, except for the story of his death. Oh, no. I'm sorry. We need his book. He wrote a book called The Method. And he dedicated that book to Eratosthenes, which is interesting because this is one of the people we just said has, you know, top three historic mathematicians and he's dedicating his work to another mathematician. So that lets us know that probably, um, if you remember, Eratosthenes is the guy with latitude and longitude. Probably um, Archimedes actually respected the work that Eratosthenes was doing, and this guy actually will eventually end up being the director of Alexandria's library. So you know he's he's kind of kind of influential. So I'm thinking that my my opinion on that is that Archimedes must have valued his work in some way for him to dedicate the book to it. 
um, the method was a method of exhaustion. So rather than prove something the way we would, would do in modern times, um, what Archimedes would do is if you want to figure out some, some something in number theory, rather than prove it for the general case, I'm just going to work on every case that could possibly happen to exhaustion until we're all tired of it, basically, and you're convinced that I'm right and that this will work. For instance, two odd numbers add together, they're always an even. Okay, well, instead of, um, you know, proving 2n plus 1 plus 2n plus 1 always gives you a 1 plus 1, which is 2, um, he would try to work that out. All the different possible scenarios that could happen, all the different ways it could happen, and then show you, okay, so it, in every case, it must be true, so therefore it's true. So, that's what he did. Um... He wrote on other topics like history and philosophy, but of course we like him for the for the mathematics of it all. And uh, I think that's I think that is it. Yeah, um, the reason why he didn't write a ton apparently is he liked to hide his math a little bit, and he's actually one of the first ones who did this that we have record of, I guess. Um, he would hide his math not because he was trying to keep stuff from people, but because as he said. He wanted other people to have the enjoyment of being able to figure it out on their own. He didn't want to take that away from you. You needed to have that, that fun. Okay. So one more story about him. Um, there's different stories about this, actually. So you can read different stories in and of yourself and decide which one you want to believe. But we're fairly certain that his death was attributed to a Roman soldier. Whenever the Roman soldiers started coming in and taking over um, Alexandria and trying to, to burn down things and, and whatever, there's one story that says that the emperor at the time said, bring me that Archimedes because I want him to work for me, you know, because he was so smart. And uh, so there's one story that says that the Roman soldiers... Um, entered into his house and were trying to gather him up and he was working on his, again, concentrating so hard on a problem, working on a problem and just wouldn't cooperate with them, um, wouldn't leave the math that he was doing and was so focused that he was struggling against the soldiers and that, quote, accidentally, he was run through with a sword. So that's one story. Um, another story is that the Roman soldiers went to his house to get him, but he wasn't there. Um, so both of these have to do with his concentration level, by the way. So he wasn't in his home, supposedly. So they went looking for him elsewhere. They're on the streets. And supposedly, they, one of these Roman soldiers just stumbles across Archimedes, and he's actually kneeling down, drawing something in the sand and not paying any attention whatsoever to these soldiers that are going by, and that the soldier that stumbles over him is mad because he's in his way and he won't move. He's like, hey, old man, get out of my way. Um, what are you doing? And that Archimedes ignores him, and supposedly the soldier gets so mad that he runs him through with his sword, and then only much later does he realize that it was actually Archimedes that he had killed, and... Um, I'm sure that the Roman soldier probably did not live long after that. So, would be my guess. So, anyway, there's different stories about his death. Um, most of them do center around the Roman invasion of Alexandria. So, again, you can, you can be your own judge for those. Okay, so the lesser known person, Apollonius. Actually, I think there's only one P in there. Apollonius of Perga. Usually, whenever they say that like that, like Apollonius of Perga, it normally means there are multiple Apolloniuses, so they're trying to tell us which one it is. So this guy would be the person whose home city, basically, was Perga. That's what it, you're from there is what that normally means. Okay, so we've got 262 to 190 BC are his dates, so we're still before the time of Christ. He was in what's known as Turkey today. 
So over near Babylonia, okay, he's a Greek guy, he's over near um, the Babylonians and the Arabian Peninsula. The reason why we like him is because he wrote a book called The Conics, which is meant to be very iconic. It was, it's thought to be in a very iconic um, book on cones. Okay, so here's a picture of a cone. And if you think about it, um, if you take slices of cones, if you've never heard of what a conic is before, if I just come in here and I take cross sections of this cone, I can get different pictures. For instance, if I take the section that just takes off this very top piece of the cone, I won't carry any of the rest of it, then I'll get a circle, right? Oh my goodness, I can't write tonight. I'll get a circle. And if I take the piece that just cuts vertically on here, if you think about that, it's really wide at the top and it narrows down to a point here, I'll get a parabola. And depending on how I cut it, tells me what kinds of things I get in. For instance, if I take a slice at an angle like this, I'll get an ellipse. So there's different ones, there's hyperbolas and different things that we, hyperbolic functions, things that we can talk about. But those three are the main ones, the circle, the parabola, and the ellipse. And I would say that in modern times, most of us have definitely worked with circles and parabolas and ellipses. And at one point in the semester, I think we'll actually do some work with some, some of that. Um, but the thing that Apollonius did was he wrote a book on it and specifically called it out as the conics, okay? Things that are sliced off of a cone, basically. Um, sections of cones is what we might call it in modern days. So he wrote that book and was, as far as we know, the first one to officially put it down in writing um, what was going on inside of a cone, basically. So kind of interesting. All right. So what's going to happen? What next? <laughs> what we're going to see is that the Greek society is beginning to dwindle. And as the Greeks go down in popularity, so to speak, in power, in um, control of the region, things like that. The Romans go up. So what we'll see is that control for the regions, and in particular, we're going to talk about Alexandria right now, but later other area areas of the map, um, control for this region um, shifts hands a lot. Right? We started out, we were in Egypt, um, we were being run by pharaohs, different ones, and then um, Alexander the Great came down and conquered and liberated, supposedly, and made Alexandria, okay? And then we know that Alexander the Great didn't stay, he left, and then after he was gone, um, there were a lot of other pharaohs that came through, <laughs> And these people are like kings or emperors. Um, the two big ones that we see are Ptolemy, and it's P-T-O-L-E-M-Y, and Cleopatra. Okay. And it's interesting because a lot of times we'll say, oh, Cleopatra, queen of the Nile, and everybody knows who we're talking about. But the interesting part of that is we really don't know who we're talking about. And the reason why is because while we think one Cleopatra, there were actually a lot of Cleopatras. I can't remember the number, but I think at one point there were like 13 or 15 Ptolemies and like eight or nine Cleopatras. So which Cleopatra, which Ptolemy, it's very difficult to understand which one's which. Um, the, hand, the people die and the next one comes up. And in fact, you might not have even been named Cleopatra. You might not even be related to Cleopatra, but all of a sudden you're the, the empress and, or the pharaoh, the, the queen, and uh, your name becomes Cleopatra because, um, because, well, you're the queen. Yeah, so we have to name you the same one. So what's happening, though, is that we're seeing the pharaohs weakening. 
You know, they were living on basically a slave system. Um, the slave system's not doing so well. <laughs> um, if you're a Bible person, you probably know the story of Moses and leading the people out of Egypt. So there are different stories about that. Um, they just don't have the power over the people that they used to. So their power is weakening. And anytime, you know, that saying, nature abhors a vacuum. Anytime that there is weakness, somebody stronger is likely to come through. So there's a time of transition that's going on here. Somebody stronger is going to come in and take over. And for us, that's going to be the Roman Empire. Okay, the Roman Empire. So, um, famous Romans who impacted the decline of Alexandria. Um, you may actually know some of them. I think of them whenever I think Roman emperors. Um, <laughs> Rome is dominating the area. You've got Mark Antony. who is a half of Mark Antony and Cleopatra, right? Okay, you've got Julius Caesar. Oops, Julius. And you've got Caesar Augusta. Or some people might say Augustine, Caesar Augusta. So these two, I think I may have mentioned them even on the first day of class the first week we had class. Um, these two particular people um, seem to be very dominating and power hungry. And it's a bit of a soap opera going on with different people trying to take over um, power and things like that. So there's here's, here's some little factoids. I don't care if you know them or not. But one of the things that is said is that Cleopatra and Julius Caesar were together and Julius Caesar was assassinated in 44 BC, and then Antony and Cleopatra get together, and they both commit suicide around 30 BC. So there's, there's just all this um, in drama that's going on. It's a soap opera going on. And um, one of the major things that we get from Romans is actually these two guys, and I think I mentioned in our calendar, we actually today have what's called a Gregorian calendar, or there was something called a Julian calendar. And what we have right now is a 12 month calendar. And two months may have been added in at some point, and we would know them as July and August. And it is speculated that they were added in um, in honor of these two Roman emperors. So, tying back to day one or day two of class right there. There we go. Okay, so they are relatively important in the shaping of things because they're so power hungry and so dominating and violent. But it is said that there is actually no... Roman mathematics that is worthy of study. No Roman Empire mathematics is worthy of study, which is probably why the emperor wanted Archimedes, <laughs> so he could have that feather in his cap. Worthy of study. All right, so why, you might ask. Well... Worthy of study to a mathematician may not be the same as worthy of study to, you know, general population out there. Um, their, pop, their math was utilitarian. So it is said that in their math, um, they didn't care about things like proofs and stuff like that, like we'd been dealing with through the Greek empire, the Greek civilization. Um, instead, what they cared about was surveys of land, taxes, civil engineers. In fact, it said that all they did was measure and count. <laughs> 
Okay, so they're measuring and counting, but goodness gracious, we've been measuring and counting the entire time we were in Egypt before we went to Greece, right? So we're two civilizations ago we were measuring and counting. So who are these Romans that all they care about is their taxes, because they're money hungry, and um, measuring the, surveying the land and things like that. So um, not much going on there. And in fact, we don't have a single Roman mathematician that we're gonna study. Instead, what we'll study is a little bit of a Greek mathematician that happened during the rise of the Roman Empire. So we wanna pull him in because um, it's believed that the, the Greek mathematicians who were so scholarly and so active in, in learning things, new things, and developing new math, um, were actually persecuted under the Roman Empire. So here's what we got. Um, sometime around, there, there's, well, there's about 500 years <laughs> of the Roman Empire where they're really dominating things. Okay, and it starts sometime around 200 BC, around the time that um, Archimedes is killed. So sometime around there, and it runs till about 300 or 400 um, AD. So what we know is going on at that particular point in time is that we know that um, the Romans are destroying books, which is really a, a bad thing, destroying our texts. Okay, so as they come into Alexandria and they start taking over the museum, they actually will go in and sack and loot um, the library and burn things and burn different buildings that are holding texts and, and all of that kind of thing. Um, so they're, they're destroying the texts, the books. They have no oral history, and not like the Greeks did. You know, we had Spa, remember, Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. So that was all a Greek uh, tradition and lots of stuff being orally handed down. And they got nothing like that, the Romans. Um, so that's kind of a problem. Um, so they are destroying all of these things. And what happens is, well, you think about it for a second. <laughs> if the Romans are coming in and they're taking over Alexandria and they're burning all the texts, and I'm a scholar, a Greek scholar, what am I going to do? I'm going to grab the things that are valuable to me, which is probably anything that I've been working on, anything that I've been writing, textbooks that have been influential to me. If I've been studying Euclid elements, then I know that they're coming in and burning things, then for sure I don't want them burning Euclid's elements. So I'm going to pack up all the stuff I can get feasibly, you know, on my person or on my ox or whatever I'm traveling with and I'm gonna run, okay, so that's what they do. They flee um, for fear that, you know, they'll end up like Archimedes, so I'm gonna run. Um, one of the later Ptolemies actually started this um, persecution of the scholars, trying to get rid of them, um, but, but it really happened a lot with the Romans, so sometimes I can go back to Greece. However, if you think about it, Let's get a map up here. We've got the Greek civilization taking in all of this area, and Rome is in Italy. Rome is in the boot. So we've got this Roman Empire and the Greeks, and they're really fighting over each other, and they're fighting over territorial stuff. In fact, I'm going to put an R there for Rome. Um, <laughs> so they're fighting against one another, and um, so I probably don't want to go back to Greece. I'm here in Alexandria. I'm on the Mediterranean Sea. I have places I can go other than Greece, right? So it actually ends up that a lot of them end up, and we'll talk about this in the next week or so, um, a lot of them up, end up in here in Turkey, in what will end up being called Constantinople, over here in the Arabian Peninsula with um, a lot of Arab, um, Arab, uh, what's the word I'm trying to think? Influence, 
Arab influence. And so we now speak, if you, if you will think about it, we now use Hindu Arabic numbers, right? That's what we call them, Hindu Arabic numbers. And somehow this influx of knowledge had to happen, and now is about the time that we think that it started happening. So there's, there are all these scholars, and they're fleeing, and they're probably not going toward Rome. They're probably coming east or northeast. So we'll see them headed that direction. So, um, yeah, I might go to Greece, but probably I'm going to the Arab nations. And Turkey seemed to be a very popular um, stop because there was a time, and what happened was, so what had happened was there was a rise in the Roman, um, the Roman Empire, and there was a lot of scuffling going on. There was a lot of greed and this and that, ambition. Just for, just to let you see what's going on. Roman emperors, let me give you some, some numbers. Around, around 235 AD, so that's after the time of Christ. So going toward the end of the Roman Empire here, the end of their, their heyday, let's see. It's about 50 years. In about 50 years, there were 24 emperors. In about 50 years, there were 24 emperors. How is this possible, we might say? Um, well, it's because they were greedy, right? and they were killing people, and we have Shakespeare to tell us all about it with Julius Caesar and different stories, right? So they were burning Bibles because, of course, um, the Roman Empire at first did not like Christianity. Christianity is spreading, right? It's a, it's a religion that it, um, has become popular, and therefore it has become a problem. So because of that, they're burning Bibles, they're destroying churches. There's a very famous female mathematician, I'm not going to talk about her, but I hope that somebody probably will in our, um, when we do our presentations toward the end of the semester. And there's a very famous female who is actually a mathematician and a teacher, and she is literally dismembered by a Christian mob. So there's a lot of fighting going back and forth, both sides of the problem. And what ends up happening is sooner or later, finally, let me give you uh, some numbers here. We have Constantine come along. Constantine is the emperor of what ends up being the eastern part, let me make sure I got that right. Yeah, the eastern part of the Roman Empire. So at one point it's grown so big that it has two seats. One is um, in Rome, in the western part, of, of the Roman Empire, and one is over here in the eastern part, which is actually in what would probably be modern-day Turkey. So um, he establishes a town there. It's called, you might have heard of it, Constantinople. I know, it's got to have his name on it, right? Um, so he's got Constantinople. Later it'll be called Istanbul. Okay. So there's this place, it's, it's, a, it's named after him. He's defeated one of the many, many emperors in, in the Roman Empire. And um, sometime around 324 AD, he decides that Christianity should be the state religion. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, for one thing, it means we're going to stop burning books, burning Bibles in particular. It means we're going to stop destroying the churches. 
Um, all of a sudden, if you were a persecuted Christian, if you were a persecuted scholar, if you were um, being tormented, all of a sudden now you're going to be state supported. So you've got um, you've got a little bit different philosophy maybe than what you had had before. So it's Constantine. He is one of the first non-mathematicians. So mark him off. He's important. He's a non-mathematician who made a huge impact on math history. And the big reason that he made such a huge impact is because no more burning books. Stop it already. Stop burning the books. <laughs> We're losing so much knowledge to the burning of the books and the burning of, you know, everything, the churches and, and all kinds of stuff. It's just, it's just causing problems. So what happened is that um, Constantine made what's called the Edict of Milan. Okay, so the Edict of Milan, um, what it did was it said, first of all, Constantine's converting to Christianity. Okay, that's cool. But it's not enough for him to do it. Second of all, what he's going to do is he's going to sanction Christianity. And he's going to restore property. To Christians, to the churches, to different things. So we're gonna we're gonna pay them back basically. Number three, we're gonna stop, stop, stop the burning of books. And that burning of books is something that has caused a decline in the knowledge, and in particular, we know in math and science. There's stuff that we just can't get back because you guys destroyed it, so not cool. And then um, one of the things that he's gonna do is he's gonna create good schools. So we will, in fact, have a school pop up in the Constantinople area. And um, this is primarily to educate the clergy so that they can read and write and, and do things that clergy need to do. But of course, we're not gonna leave it at that. It's gonna develop and there's gonna be other stuff. And the last thing that's really important to us is that he's gonna have the priests copying old texts, and in particular, math and science texts. And what that'll do, because he's copying them, so, you know, you might have a papyrus from Egypt that's very old and brittle and it's falling apart, but because we're copying it, we're going to preserve the text and the knowledge. Okay, and that's going to be super important for us as we go forward because there's just some stuff that would have been lost without Constantine putting down his foot and, uh, and working this out for us. Okay, so we have one more mathematician. Let me check and make sure I'm not lying to you. One more mathematician that I want to cover. I think it's going to cover... I think it's going to take a little bit longer than the 10 minutes that's left allowed on this video. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop the video. Everybody can take a little breath or something. I don't think it'll be very long, maybe about 20 minutes. But um, it's definitely longer than the 10 minutes I'm left on this one. So I'm going to stop the video and I will start a part two. And we will come back and we will talk about Diophantus. D I O. P-H-A-N-T-U-S, Diophantus. So take a stretch break and then come back and we'll finish this up.